Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi. And this is Jill Wine Banks. And today we have a very special episode. I'm going to catch up with the news and everything that's happening with Victor, just the two of us talking, because I have just spent uh, more than a week in Cuba and Jill, was... first, what's your pin. Oh, my pin. Well, I'm one of the things I want to get caught up on, Victor, is the State of the Union address. Uh, I read some commentary, but I was unable to get the address in a communist country, so I didn't see it yet. I did record it, so I will see it tonight. This is my first day back because I spent three days in the Miami airport unable to get a flight. Thank you, Spring Breakers. That's your generation, Victor. That stopped me from getting a plane. Anyway, I am back home now and delighted to be back. Yes. Well, it's great to see you again. The last time we recorded an iGen Politics episode was two weeks ago. So um, it's it's great to have you back, Jill. Um, maybe we should start off with your trip to Cuba because I saw great pictures. Thank you for sending me your pictures. And I saw pictures of you know you with um, your husband. I saw pictures of you with a Dalmatian. I saw pictures of you with uh, eating great food. So tell us about it because um, I think a lot of our audience would be curious about where you went and what you did. Well, it was a wonderful trip in many, many ways. Um, a wonderful adventure travel um, operator arranged for us to study marine biology and to meet with marine biologists and to meet with uh, leaders of not-for-profit foundations that protect the environment and against climate change. And of course, the reefs against all the danger. And so it was fascinating to learn. We also were able to stay in, as is quite possible for everyone, to stay in a person's home um, and get to meet the family and you know live with them. So that was a very good, very exciting part of it. Um, although we did stay at some, at least one really, really nice resort um, that was lovely. And we ate some really good food, but mostly it was learning, you know, from listening to people, but also from just trying to access the internet. Yes. I was supposed to do a television show. I was supposed to do Eamon with Kathy Griffin. Um, and I'm denied access to Skype and to Zoom. And sometimes you could get on it. Mostly it says the government deprived, you know, it doesn't say the government it says that access is denied. Um, but the internet is so spotty that even if you can access it, um, WhatsApp was the best thing um, that I could use. And But you can't broadcast from some of those. And so I was unable to do uh, the show with uh, Kathy, which was I was really disappointed. But but I hope that you know that this is what Jill is like when she goes on vacation. It's technically <laughs> She's still finds time or would have found time to do MSNBC while she was in Cuba. But, um, you know, it's so funny because we were trying to figure it out. And then it was actually a simple Google search that I looked up on the internet. Why is Skype not working in Cuba? And it says the government blocks apps like Skype and Zoom. And so um, that was really interesting to learn about. But I'm wondering, you know, in addition to your um, learning about marine biology and some of the coral reefs, I mean, what was it like having certain things restricted. And you tweeted something out, I think, right, um, right after <clears throat> Trump, um, I think it was after a Supreme Court decision or some some legal decision. And you said, you know, this is this is what might happen to America if we elect Trump again. That was one of the most dramatic things that I saw was trying to get the news and being denied access to the news sites, being denied. Uh, Facebook doesn't work there. I don't know if that's a government issue or if there's some other reason, but I could not access uh, Facebook. I was able to get um, LinkedIn a little bit, and I was able to get um, Twitter. A Twitter X and also threads sometimes. But again, it's because of the um, internet. It's very hard to do. But you know, when you look at the poverty that's there, um, that's also a problem for me. It was, you know, this first amendment issue of hey, we're, in t we're used to having full access to anything. I can get Fox news and I can get MSNBC. I can hear both sides. Uh, I can look up the facts and people there simply can't. Although I did find that most people knew certain things about January 6th, as I would inquire, um, and, 
Ukraine was an issue and they knew that Russia had unprovoked invaded. So I was sort of happy to hear that because I was worried that they get a lot of support from Russia and China and they're very dependent on them. And so um, I, I would say I'm, I want to do some talking to people who are experts, but the more I thought about it, our policy of non-engagement seemed to me to be very wrong, that we could, and and I, having lived in Florida for a year, uh, the Cuban Americans who are so vehemently opposed to any engagement or support for Cuba, and of course, Fidel is long gone and so is his brother. His brother's not quite gone. He's head of the military. He's no longer president. Um, but that we could help the people of Cuba dramatically with our assistance and our, if we would export to them and we would make money. They could, you know, pay us and sometimes in trade, sometimes in money, but the people would see what democracy means if there was ever any doubt mm -hmm. about it or whether their way is the better way. One of the most interesting places I went was the, um, the Bay of Pigs, where I snorkeled, but also was able to go to the museum and see their version of the Bay of Pigs invasion, which may mean more to me. I, I'm curious, Victor, whether you even know what I'm talking about when I say Bay of Pigs. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, it was like during Cold War. And I, I, I yes, I did live through it, obviously. Well, but No, you didn't. But I did. Um, President Kennedy yeah. enabled through the CIA an invasion of uh, Cuba, which ended up at Heron, which is part of the Bay of Pigs. And it was known as the Bay of Pigs invasion, although that is not what it's called in Cuba. In Cuba, it's called the hero's defeat of <laughs> the invading forces. Oh. And, and, and it was, they did defeat us. Um, and I don't want to go into all the details of how not all the planes and backup support were given to the invaders. But the reason it's especially important to me or known to me is that Howard Hunt, who was one of the Watergate defendants in the burglary trial and the Cuban Americans who were caught red handed in the Democratic National Committee headquarters as the burglars were all part of the Bay of Pigs invasion. They, the Cuban Americans were violently against Fidel Castro. And I understand why he stole, he expropriated without payment um, in his mind for the good of the other people that he was gonna redistribute it to. But you know, if you've lost your company and your home and everything else, you'd be pretty upset with the government that did that to you. And so I get being against Fidel Castro, but we're long past that. The, you know, I was there, um, in 2012, uh, just before the election, uh, the second election of, of, of President Obama. And there were starting to be a few private businesses. The government was allowing certain restaurants that were in people's homes where their family was the only employees. Now, private businesses and stores are everywhere and are taken over. Um, when we were there, we ate in a lot of government run restaurants and they were fine, but the best restaurants were the privately owned. And now almost everything is privately owned. So they're moving a long way away from the communist ideal that they started with. And I think it would be great for you know more Americans to learn about what's happening and for us to think about whether we could help America and Cubans. I'm not saying the Cuban government, I'm saying the Cuban people by doing this. So that's that's my report on my trip. And I, I will start maybe posting. I was afraid to post because of the blockades of websites. Right. I didn't want to post anything or even try to. Um, I wasn't able to post about the Sisters-in-Law live tour, which let me just plug it here, is going to be on May 2nd in Chicago and on May 9th in Detroit, Barbara's hometown and actually Kim's birthplace, although she doesn't live there now, she was born there. And um, then in Boston, which is her uh, Kim's adopted home because she of course is an opinion writer for the Boston Globe. So she spent a lot of time there. So that's on May 30th. So it's May 2nd, May 9th, and May 30th. Tickets are available at politicon.com forward slash tickets. Ooh. So please, everyone, 
come and see us. It's it. We love meeting you, and I hope you will love watching us and well, meeting us. I, I might have to come because May thirtieth is uh, my birthday, so maybe I'll have to come spend a day with you guys. Uh, well, that would be great. And I, and by May thirtieth, uh, by the way, seems to me you're going to be closer to the East Coast. Is that not correct? And so you could come to Boston. Absolutely, just an Amtrak away, as Joe Biden likes to say. Um, I def absolutely, um, but I, but I think you know it's so interesting hearing you talk about other. It's it's always interesting to see what other countries think of the U.S. And I am comforted by the fact that you know things are getting better, and hopefully we can have some role in helping the Cuban people. And um, you know I'm glad that they know a little bit about January 6th. I'm wondering if they have the same sort of shared understanding of it as that we do. Um, do they think of January 6th as this? insurrection and bad day for democracy or is do they think of I, it as i'll i'll post a picture if i could find it now i will hold it up there is a trump versus cuba book that i saw in the airport so they they view biden as much better for them trump is a disaster they thought obama was the best for mm -hmm. cuba that he really tried to help Cuba um, and that Trump did the opposite. So that's the opinion. Now I'm talking to high, you know, people who speak English. Um, so I guess some of them I had a translator. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think there's more knowledge about us in Cuba. And I, what I was worried about was how many, uh, you know, how much of that was filtered through Russian propaganda as opposed to from our side, because they certainly aren't getting our um, our news, because I couldn't get our news. And um, let's see, because this was at the Cuban airport that I was finally, let's see, that was our last night. I'm almost there, hold on. Yeah, and Jill has had a quite a whirlwind of a trip, as she said, she was supposed to come back. We're holding this up, let's see, can you see? The, yeah. It says, do you see that one? Uh, yeah, up there, it's called Trump versus Cuba. So that was on a rack in the airport in Cuba, in Havana, or wow. La, La Habana. Okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna have to see your pictures. So post them online so our audience can see and uh, we're, we're uh, glad you're back. And, and thank you. you. Or a very so long fill me in, fill me in because I, of course, did not have access to the State of the Union address. And I have heard and read online some commentary that he was a fantastic, energetic, funny, um, and serious. And I, so I, I taped the State of the Union. And of course, by the way, everyone, Victor and I wrote a um, op-ed for MSNBC, which you can all get on their website, uh, about what we thought could be done to make it a more January 6th hearing-like uh, event than the pomp and circumstance only of the current event. Right. And I hope you'll read it and agree with us that some changes to the format might be helpful to getting particularly Victor's generation and those above and below him to pay more attention because their attention span is about three minutes, except for Victor. He has a much longer attention span. But no, not three minutes. It's like three seconds, actually. <laughs> Okay, I'm giving them three minutes because I think I could hold their attention for three minutes. I really do. But um, anyway, it's a very short attention span. So a 90 minute speech is going to just fall on deaf ears. And it, we were thinking that if they could use video uh, clips, if they could use other speakers, not just the president, but people who have been helped by all his policies, that that would be a real way to connect, use the peers of people who have been helped. So you would have you know, students talk about the student loan forgiveness and how that has benefited them, not just students, but the people who are older and have been paying for years and years and years, but are now forgiven their debt. Um, right. Anyway, read it and let us know what you think. Yeah, and, apps, and, and you know, there, in fact, there were some things that they implemented. For instance, you know, we, we talked a lot about what should happen during the speech, but um, we also talked about what should happen after the speech. And um, one of the things that the White House did that I was just reading up on last week was that they brought in a bunch of content creators to, into the White House. And so um, they the total number of followers, I think, combined from all the content creators that they brought in was something like 100 million people that they're going to 
speech. So, you know, it, it's going to go beyond, I think, traditional news. We'll see if that makes a difference in terms of people's uh, public opinion of President Biden. But um, I thought that sort of creator event was was very promising. And it seems like um, they're deploying a bunch of the cabinet secretaries um, to different states now. And, and so they're, they're trying to create, so they're trying to ride on that momentum that they created during the State of the Union. But it was a great State of the Union. And I'm just going to use Fox News' um, words because um, Sean Hannity, right after the State of the Union, described it as jacked up Joe and that he had a lot of energy. <laughs> So um, Fox thought that he had a lot of energy and he was very energetic. I mean, he was he 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 spoke so passionately and with such vigor and 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 energy. And um, there was there were a few moments during the State of the Union where Republicans once again heckled at him and uh, he just shot them right down, just like he did last year. And it was a it was a it was a great moment. Um, and I thought for anyone who has any sort of doubts about his age, that speech was what they needed to um wow. And that he's down and and up, ready for the job in 2024. But I thought it was really spectacular. But we both actually watched the response by Republicans to the State of the Union. It was by um, the junior senator from Alabama. Her name is Katie Britt. And she uh, was described by a lot of Republicans as a talented politician. Um, Mitch McConnell and, and people who are within the Republican Party see her as the future. But that speech, I didn't see a single positive review, at least on my timeline. And it just appeared really creepy. One of the best tweets I read was um, she really is in the place where she belongs as a woman in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, so I mean, we do see Claire McCaskill in her kitchen doing MSNBC. So I don't react as the kitchen is totally out of the picture, but it does seem completely wrong when the president has just been in the House of Representatives with all the pomp and circumstance to have the response not be from her Senate office with a flag of Alabama, a flag of the United States, with whatever. Um, it, it seemed a little off tone, but I'm, I think what was worse was one, her substance, and two, I hate to say this, but her delivery, her voice, her almost like I'm going to cry, and it's really so awful. I mean, I can't do the, the first thing I saw actually was not her, I saw what turned out to be Scarlett Johansson, I had no idea who it was because she looked so like, exactly. I mean, even the same color, everything was perfect. Her hair, I thought saying it was very everything. Easy. It was amazing. Um, oh, yeah. So then I heard her and I was like, how could she be saying this? We care about the family. No, you don't. If you did, you would be passing things that would help the families. It was so disingenuous. I was horrified by that. And I I guess I'll watch it again as part of what I recorded, but maybe well, not because I it also made me angry and sad. It, and it, when you said this is the face of the future, this is the face of why the Republican Party will never attract women. It's the face of the handmaid's tale. Right. It is, I mean, she looked like um oh, what was that the um I can't think of the right name of the Stepford wives, like she was this plastic. I couldn't believe, at, at first I thought this is not really the response. This is a parody because she sounded like a parody. Um, and based on the what I've read about the sort of the pushback from it, if she was on the list for potential vice presidential candidates, which is what I also read, um, I think that, that maybe they'll take her off. What do you think? Or maybe, or maybe this will only make it more solidified for Trump because that's the type of woman he likes. I don't know. Um, maybe. I, I was actually reading a little bit about her, and she, interestingly enough, was um, one of the senators who helped negotiate that border deal at first with Senator James Lankford from um, Oklahoma, I think is the state. And it was a bipartisan deal. And then she was one of the senators. Once Trump called, she ended up voting against the Senate deal. So if, if there's anything that tells you something about her, I think that's sort of she's a political tool. I don't think she has any sort of conviction. Um, and I, I'm just curious what Republic like what Republicans were thinking when they chose to put her in the kitchen right after the State of the Union, how they chose to allow that to happen with that delivery. And that really, I mean, people just thought it was creepy. It was strange. It was, um, someone described it as cringy, which I thought was a, a good yeah. way to put it. I mean, it, it was just so, 
everything about it was was really weird and i and i don't think anyone sort of likes that and and I, and i'm just the wondering. setting was the least of the problems it was the content that was the big problem right and especially after um at least i couldn't help but think about you know we talk a lot about age and experience and i was just thinking that's what happens when you uh are uh in, in, what could happen if you're in your 40s and don't have a lot of experience in politics and just to see that right after president biden spoke where you know he ha he was yes he was old but you could tell that he had the experience to navigate the senate and navigate the house and you know all of the all of his experience you know in decades prior with all of what he's done since i mean it, it's impressive and then to see katie Britt respond in the way that she did it just makes you i think appreciate president biden even more and the fact that we have a sane and experienced and wise leader um at the helm right now but yeah i i'm curious to see what happens with katie Britt and and whether or not her political future is uh over or brighter, as you said, could be. But let's let's talk a little bit about all the stuff about Trump. I've been cramming to um, you know find out since I landed back in America and have had free access to things. Um, and I did get back, by the way, in time for seeing most of the Academy Awards. I'm looking forward to seeing the beginning, which I understand was really good. Um, but let's 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 leave that for the end because. There's so much happening in Trump news. And my reading is that he may be the luckiest man in the world because he got Judge Cannon, for example, because he got the Supreme Court he has, which is causing delay that should not happen. Because, I mean, I don't even know why, but as we look at, okay, so we have a, a pending soon to happen trial. I mean, in just a few, what would say is in, in a two weeks, less than two weeks, the trial in New York should be beginning. And he made a motion to basically delay the case pending the Supreme Court's decision on immunity. But he did it after the deadline for pretrial motions, which means it should automatically be denied, period. That's the end of it. You had your time. And it's not like he didn't know about the Supreme Court in time for the deadline to meet. But also what people are missing is that, one, there is no legal basis for his complaint about this immunity thing. He raised the immunity decision in an effort to get the case removed from New York courts to federal court. And the federal court judge, district court judge uh, Hellerstein said, there's no way that this was an official act. He was covering up private embarrassing conduct and mm -hmm. business, um, trying to get a business benefit from it. And this is not part of his official conduct. And he appealed it and then withdrew the appeal. So he's given up all right to contest that. It's been decided, folks. It's over. So there should, he missed the deadline. And it was already determined anyway against him, which is probably why he missed the deadline, because he knew it was hopeless. And I don't think there's any way Judge Mershon, who's the judge of this case, will grant it. But of course, everybody's on tender hooks waiting to see what's going to happen in that case. Right. Um, we're still pending a decision in what happens in Georgia. Um, I, of course, was gone and didn't see all of the hearing what was your impression um i actually didn't watch many of the hearings either um so i i only saw the the first day when bonnie willis testified and i think we talked a little bit about that or maybe maybe we didn't but i was i mean i was really impressed by her father in particular yes. and hearing her father talk about just what it means to be a black person in the world and how it, you, you really can't like unless you are a black person in the world, it's very hard to understand some of the things that they did. For instance, the fact that she had to carry around money with her and then to hear her father talk about why why he taught her to do that. I mean, it was um really moving to to hear that. But I didn't watch any actually of the of the testimony since then. No. I, yeah. I did get to see some of it. Um I did not get to see Bradley, uh the ex partner of oh. Wade, um, who apparently went from writing to the defense team saying Oh, listen, I got news for you about when this relationship started is saying, I have no idea when it started. I really, I don't, I don't, I don't know. So he seemed to be a totally incredible witness for mm -hmm. both sides. And that means the jury will reject anything. That, well, 
the judge in this case, it's not a jury case. Um, but we should get a decision maybe at the end of this week um, oh. about whether this is a go or a not go. And that could be the second trial um, if the Supreme Court dilly dallies. And I'm very disappointed in their taking the case and not making an immediate decision or setting a really speedy trial uh, um, hearing date. They could have had arguments much sooner. The case was fully briefed for the Court of Appeals for the Circuit for the District of Columbia. And um, if I can recommend a reading for our audience, there is a great piece in the New York Times by a friend of the podcast, Kate Shaw, and she makes an interesting argument about the reason why the Supreme Court should act speedily is because the public has a right to know um, yes be informed, right? And the basis of our democracy is that people go to the ballot box informed and educated about the candidates who they're voting for. And so to have a trial before the election and give people enough time to know about both the evidence and, and the trial is important. And I think um, she made a really compelling um, point in the New York Times. And I think it was published yesterday. I mean, yesterday, meaning Monday, uh, March 11th. So if you have the chance to read that, read it. It's a very quick read and very easy read. And um, I think she makes a good point about why this report should move quickly on this, but it doesn't seem like they are. Well, they definitely aren't. I mean, April 25th is a long time off and you don't know, are they going to issue the decision as they did in uh, Bush v. Gore and in Watergate within uh, a day or a week, or are they going to take a month or two? That changes everything. So um, maybe you can post the link to that oh. article in our show notes and email it to me right away because I definitely wasn't getting the New York Times while I was in Cuba. So I haven't had the, the privilege of seeing that. Um, and I'm going to send you, Victor, a link to a very thought-provoking article uh, that maybe we'll talk about in a future episode after you've had a chance to read it because I'd be very curious as to whether there's a generational difference in the reaction to this. Okay. Um, so anyway, so we've, let's see, we covered New York, we covered Canon, we covered Georgia, January 6th trial is still awaiting the right. Supreme right. Court. So nothing there. Let's talk about the her report. Um, I got to Chicago very late afternoon, so I haven't seen a lot of it, but I did see some of the her testimony. Did you see any of it? I did. I actually watched most of it, um, except for the tail end right before they 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 um, uh, went to lunch or took a break. Um, but I, I watched his opening and I watched the questioning. And, you know, I have to say, reading the transcript was really interesting. I mean, there were points where her said, you know, Biden had a photographic um, like recollection of this certain event, or he would ask, you know, I think in the report, he said something about how Biden could remember the year that um, Bo Biden died. But in the transcript, he asked whether or not he could remember the day and the month, which President Biden did. Yeah. He said May 30th. Oh, God. Right. And then um, but, you know, that didn't really make it into the report. So there were some interesting things to see, you know, what made it into the report and what didn't. Um, but I do have to say, I mean, his opening, I thought, was really compelling. And and I I um, think he's a very at least good, at least talker and um, uh, good, <laughs> you know, he he's a good witness, I think. And, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts, you know, after listening to him and sort of his justification for um, releasing it in the way that he did, he mentioned something about how he had to include the age component because it get, got into mens rea and the state of mind. But, you know, what do you think of, of what you heard from today? So, well, I only heard the tail end before they adjourned. Um, so I'm, I would like to hold my comments until I can watch more of it and have a better opinion. But, you know, he is a good lawyer and uh, trial lawyers are good at handling things. I did hear one comment while I, while I was listening and I can't remember um, who's who the speaker was, or even whether it was a Democrat or Republican, because I was listening, not watching. And it was something like, you're losing on both sides. The Democrats hate you and the Republicans hate you, which means you must be doing something right that everybody thinks you're down the middle. And that is sort of true. When you piss off both sides, it means that maybe you are cutting it down the middle. And I thought that was actually a thought provoking comment and I will have to await seeing it. Obviously I was very irate about 
the report when I first read it and read his, you know, totally superfluous commentary, gratuitous is the word that's usually applied, about his mental state. Um, and it is very interesting to read uh, the transcript, which I haven't read the full thing, but I've read the excerpts that have been commented on, and how different it is saying he didn't remember the year of his son's death in the context that it appeared, it was meaningless. And um, so I think that reading the whole thing shows that he was really with it and relaxed and funny and knowledgeable and- it jokes. Um, it was, it was um, I, I didn't read all of the transcript, but I just saw select portions of it. And, you know, he made a joke, for instance, you can tell I was old. You can, you can tell I'm old because I put my arm around Lindsey Graham. Or, uh... <laughs> I didn't see that. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I really think the whole, it's always true when you read the whole transcript, as opposed to an excerpt. Right. All excerpts are out of context. And it's only when you see the whole thing from start to finish, not just the sentence before the quotation and the sentence after the whole thing that you can really understand the impression that a jury, for example, would get, or the conclusion that an ordinary voter would get, all of us would get. And no, so I, I think it's important. You know, I heard someone say something about the type of person who should be in a position like a special counsel. Um, I, I forgot. Oh, it was Anthony Cole who said this on MSNBC right after they took a break. And he said, you know, Merrick Garland made an error in appointing the a, person like Robert Hur, because Robert Hur is in his mid fifties. He's not at the end of his career. He should have, cho he should have selected someone who is at the end of his career and didn't really have an urge to find their next job after this. You know, I think it's it, Eric Swalwell asked Robert Hur today, um, whether or not he would accept a position in the Trump administration. Hur didn't respond. He just said, you know, I'm not here to answer that question, but you know, if there were, was a future Republican administration, I don't see a reason why Robert Hur wouldn't accept a position, um, because he's only in his mid fifties. 50s and he's not that old anyway. So um, I thought that was an interesting point about who are the type of people we should be appointing to this type of position. Um, and I was, I, I felt, I thought that was compelling. Well, I want to raise a broader question, which is why we think that a Democratic president must be investigated by a Republican and a Republican president must be investigated by a Democrat. Although I'm, I'm, for example, was Mueller a Democrat? I'm not sure. I think he actually may be a Republican. What? Well, he he voted, I think, Republican at the beginning of his life, but he hasn't voted. I think I read somewhere he, he's he classifies himself as an independent, where he doesn't vote. Okay, so, or do we need an independent for both? I personally think, from my experience as a prosecutor and from my knowledge of prosecutors, that we all seek to uncover the facts right. and match them up with the law, yeah. and that I would reach the same conclusion against Trump that I would reach against Biden if the facts were the same. As I investigate, I didn't start out Watergate assuming that Richard Nixon was guilty. I assumed that there were some facts to be uncovered. And the more we uncovered, the more obvious it was that he was guilty. But that had nothing to do with his politics. It had something to do with the facts and the law that existed. So I I wish we could get away from Democratic judges and Republican judges and Democratic prosecutors and Republican prosecutors. I was actually hired at justice under the Democrats, but my security clearance came through after Richard Nixon hmm. had been elected. And I was sworn in just before his inauguration. So I served almost my entire term at justice under Richard Nixon or Gerald Ford after Nixon left. Um, so I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I was a federal prosecutor. I represented the people of the United States. And I wish we could get back to a world where Democrats and Republicans saw prosecutors. And I think one of the worst things Donald Trump has done is to convince the American public that the Department of Justice and prosecutors and judges can't be trusted. And or don't Tim can't be trusted. The what? Those who are going after him can't be trusted. Well, that's for sure. But I think it has a broader impact. I really do. I think it has made people go, I can't trust anything in the government. So, right. you know, that's kind of sort of bad. But maybe we can end on a higher level. Like, yeah, let's talk about the Academy Awards. 
talk about it. You know, I um I, I watched I didn't watch the whole thing because it was so long. And this year they actually made it earlier um than than usual, which so on Pacific time, it was 4 p.m. Pacific time, which is right as I was heading out. It's usually at 7 p.m. Pacific time, and I can watch m most of it. Um, but one of my favorite parts was actually listening to something that Christopher Nolan said, and I have been really, um, uh, I've been really sort of pulled in by Christopher Nolan recently. I've been looking at his biography, and I just really respect his craft. But when he won, um, I think it was the best director of the year, and he said something that I thought was thought provoking. He said, "I have the quote up here." He said, "Quote." Movies are just a little bit over 100 years old. I mean, imagine being there 100 years into a painting or theater, he remarked while accepting his Oscar. We don't know where this incredible journey is going from here, but to know you think I'm a meaningful part of it means the world to me. Wow. Yeah. The one that got me was the um, acceptance of the award for the Ukrainian film, and it made me cry. I mean, I, I, I as I say, I was stuck overnight in the Miami airport, two nights in a row, not right. just one, but um, one of those nights was Sunday. So I got, I had the pleasure of actually not being flying and being able to, to watch the Academy Awards. And I really teared up at what he was saying. Um, I would have to look up the quote, but about the importance of the fight that's going on in Ukraine. And it was very moving to me. So I, I was happy. And then I was also sort of mesmerized by the shoulder straps of Emily Blunt's dress. Sorry, oh. for, but really, whoa. Um, it sort of made her look hunched up because the shoulders were up to here. Uh, what did you think? Did you even notice it? No, I didn't. I, you didn't no. notice it? Oh, my God. Go the only thing I noticed was, uh, only because she pointed it out, was when... Um, Emma Stone was accepting her nomination. She said her dress was- Multiple times, my dress is broken and turned right. around and said, look, here it is. Right, but what? But did you see how she, um, how that award was given to her? I mean, with all five of the past um, uh, female actress or main actresses of the year. I mean, that was really moving. And I they thought. did the same with actor and I think supporting actor as well. And that was very, I mean- Sally Fields is the flying nun and many other wonderful things. Um, I mean, it was great. And Jessica Lange, I mean, these are icons from, you know, my youth. And <laughs> it was great to see. Yeah, I thought that was, a, I yeah. thought the show was really wonderful. Um, and then Kimmel, Kim, Kimmel was terrific. I thought, I, I, you told me, but I haven't seen yet, but I do have it recorded because we got to the hotel room too late to watch the beginning, that the beginning was really funny. And I saw a lot of funny stuff that he did. It was, right. it was very, very good. Um, very well done. The very end was actually, um, there, there was a, there's a new report out um, by Variety, I think that um, reported that the producers didn't want Kimmel to read the truth social tweet um, at the end. They said, no, 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 don't do it. And Kimmel just said, I have a minute left. I'm going to do it. And so he read that truth social tweet. And then it was uh, the banger of the, of the, of evening I thought was uh well isn't it past your jail time <laughs> <laughs> and he had to have ad-libbed that yeah. I mean I, it, it's it just yeah. happened live so it, yeah that was I thought that was a great ending I thought it was a very very good show I I personally had different favorites um movies that I loved and actors that I loved and I'm not objecting to any of the ones that did win but um I, I would certainly recommend people see all the winners, but actually the little clips they showed of everything else makes me want to watch all of the short films and everything. But I loved the holdovers. I loved American fiction. They're just such wonderful experiences that I, I recommend those in particular. I, I Anatomy of a Fall. Oh yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, there were so many good ones, and I, I love I love the banter about the Barbie movie. Yeah. <laughs> Ken, um, Anatomy of a Fall got an award for like best script writing. There was this one right. scene. The I didn't watch it, but the main um, actress, um, she sort of has an accent European, I think, where she, she was. She actually is the star of two of the nominees. Oh. She's phenomenal. She was Anatomy of a Fall and Zone of Interest. 
Oh, zone of interest. Yes, yes. And I can't remember what her nationality is. Um, zone of interest, she speaks German. In this, she speaks <laughs> some French and some English. Um, well, and, Sandra hmm? is um, a German actress, but she's appeared in German, Austrian, American, British, and French films. Yeah, I mean, she's quite amazing in both films. She's very good. There's one scene in Anatomy of a Fall, and I, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a, a an exchange between her husband and her. Yes. Changes your perspective of everything you've seen before that and of everything that comes after that. Was and it when they were fighting? Hmm? When they were fighting or she was... Yes. She was yes. Yes, that was, that was a scene that I think I saw. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an amazing, amazing scene. Um, but you know, all I mean, every one of the nominees for actor and actress deserved the award. I mean, it it was really an area where you go, oh God, they're all so good. They oh. were all terrific. So, um, like Chris Nolan said, we're only a hundred years into this art form, so we'll see uh, where this amazing. Goes. It is amazing when you think about that. I mean, think about. There, there were books oh. that were only a hundred years old. I mean, yeah. oh, amazing, amazing. So, well, that was, I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and I hope everyone enjoyed the Academy Awards. Let us know what you thought about all those things. And we have a very great guest coming up next week. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Yes. And in the meantime, please uh, rate us wherever you follow your podcast, whether it's on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. You can also uh, find us on YouTube if you want to watch us at youtube.com slash Politicon. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss our episodes. Episodes every month, every Wednesday, sorry. Every Wednesday we uh, release our episodes, so be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss those. Thanks everyone for watching, and we will see you next week.